Good evening and welcome to the Northampton School Committee meeting on Thursday, July 13, 2017. My name is Ed Zahowski. I'm filling in this evening as the vice chair as the mayor is across town at the city council meeting. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Molly Burnham. Present. 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 Well, thank you very much. Uh, first order of business this evening is public comment. Um, I have a list here in front of me. I'll call folks up as you come up to the microphone if you would state your name and your address for the record. First, uh, here is Todd. I'll just refer to first names because I don't want to mess up your last name. I'm Todd DeGeronimo, <laughs> and I live on the best street in the city, 54 Bell Avenue, and I'm the ESP chapter coordinator working here at JFK in the GOALS program, and I am here to request that you approve the full-time release president's position. You may not be aware of all the problems that occurs on a day-to-day -day basis that is solved between the superintendent and uh, the release president. They stop problems. They stop problems from festering. They stop problems from going into grievances. Next year, we're going into a new special education reorganization. The ESPs are still upset on a reorganization. And the best way to solve these little problems before it turns into rumor is to solve on a daily basis. And the only way to do it is with a full-time president. If you look at the superintendent's evaluation, you have down 70 hours conducting six different contracts. That does not include the other 70 hours that those two people conducted reviewing contracts, comparing contracts, going to committee meetings, going to conferences together as a team. And that's the only way it's going to work. And I give my, the rest of my time to anyone else who would like to have it. Thank you. Next up, we have Sharon. I do, it is a standard that we have a three minute. I will run the timer here. That's okay, I won't need three minutes. My name is Sharon Carlson. I am <coughs> Uh, Vice President of the Northampton Association of School Employees. I am here this evening to ask you to reconsider your decision not to allow the NACE president full-time release. As the immediate past president, I can tell you that it is very difficult to maintain a full-time teaching position and a full-time NACE presidency. There is not enough hours in the day. And what happens if you are a good teacher and a good president, what goes by the wayside is your personal life. As I can attest to having lost relationships because of the time <clears throat> and commitment of others to these two full-time jobs. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> With the beginning of release time, members who were able to get to the president when needed, as well as the beginning of time, true mutual respect and trust which has translated into successful contracts without lawyers on both sides being involved, which has saved the district approximately $150,000 on NACE contracts with lawyer fees, with lawyers and fees. So I ask you to reconsider your position and negotiate the, president, the NACE president for time release. Thank you. We have Michelle. Hi, good evening. My name is Michelle Andrews. I live at 133 Old Stage Road in West Hatfield. Um, I'm a fifth grade teacher at Ryan Road School, and I'm a member on the District Improvement Plan Committee. And this committee was formed with the goal to implement the district's improvement plan in a meaningful and effective way. So members include the superintendent, um, our union president, all six, all six principals, three district administrators, and nine association representatives. 
Um, you may be familiar with uh, Rockford, Illinois. It's a school district that's coming back from a really challenging time. The Rockford, Illinois public school system is a model for Northampton, and we have been moving in the same direction. Like Rockford, our leaders recognize that having a strong relationship with union partners and building a strong team in our district with support from the board and strong community partnerships is essential. Stakeholder voice must be a part of this process. From the classroom to work in PLCs, to work within our own schools and in the district and even the, with the school board, having and using a common vocabulary is an intended goal of the DIP committee. In Rockford, even after contract negotiations were settled, a number of work groups continued to work for the next two years to solve difficult negotiation topics. Work like the District Improvement Plan Committee, who are now working on district goals like building relationships with families, promoting a successful home visit program. Because our president has had the release time, to date, this committee has made possible goals like response to intervention, learning walks, differentiating differentiating up, budget fairness, the Q sort, the data dashboard prototype and rollout, the Rutgers labor management study, and there is still work to be done, work that requires a full-time union president. So I'm asking you to please accept the association's request and negotiate the full-time release of our president. Thank you. Next is Robert. members. My name is Roberto Rodriguez. I'm chapter coordinator for uh, NACE. <clears throat> I work in Leeds Elementary School. I'm here to speak of the importance of a full-time release president. In our annual meeting, it was voted four to one vote with all members <clears throat> approving the uh, increase for um, full-time release president. It was so important that units A and B decided to put the bill on themselves and not put the burden on the paraprofessionals. Having a full-time release president a phone call away with an, when an issue arises puts your faculty members at ease. It resolves issues in a timely manner and helps to foster a healthy working relationship with the superintendent and his administrators. The list is long on Julie Spencer Robertson Robinson's accomplishments and can't be listed in three minutes, but I'm sure if you take a time, take some time to sit with her and talk about what she's accomplished and helped us and the school committee achieve, you'd be really surprised. I beseech you, the school council members, to look again, as you have done in the past, to find the funds to keep our full-time release president, continue with the great relationship she has with our members and superintendent's office. Show your children's teachers and other faculty members that you actually care. Have a good night. Sleep well. Andrea. Good evening. I'm Andrea Agito of Florence, and I teach kindergarten at Ryan Road Elementary School. I am the teacher chapter coordinator for the Northampton Association of School Employees. And I'd just like to share a few of the many reasons why it is so critical for you to allow for us to keep our full-time president. For example, you are aware of the many criticism and complaints from staff about the transition to a full, in full inclusion at our elementary schools. What you may not have seen is that our association president asked the superintendent to visit all six schools to talk with teachers and ESPs about the modified WINS proposal, which he did. With the help of our full-time president, I held two district-wide meetings with elementary special ed teachers so they could voice their excitement, their questions, and their concerns about the modified WINS proposal, and we could start to problem solve together. Our president organized a meeting with the SPED PAC parents to explore how we could work together to ensure a successful transition to this full inclusion. The DIP committee began drafting a plan to support the long-term success of the full inclusion model, including at our secondary schools. At the invitation of the superintendent, our full-time president met with the administrative leadership team. And in the coming year, we will continue to work to make this transition as successful as possible. A few years ago, when an advisory program was introduced at the middle school, it led to a grievance that went all the way to arbitration, costing the district thousands of dollars. 
When an advisory program was later introduced at the high school, it was the collaborative approach used by NACE and the district that prevented a similar outcome. Using this approach, administrators and the NACE leadership team were able to come to a successful rev resolution for everyone. This year at the middle school, teachers were upset about a proposed new schedule and had identified several potential contract violations they were prepared to grieve. Because our association president had full-time release, she was able to meet several times with the middle school principal and their scheduling committee to discuss the problems and explore possible solutions together. We held a well-attended meeting for the NACE Unit A members at JFK and brought their questions and concerns to teachers on the scheduling committee. The result of all this work is the implementation of the new schedule will take place in stages in a way that's best for the students and staff at JFK. We know from past experience that a teacher working full-time in the classroom is unable to be proactive in any way to resolve issues. The only thing they have time to do, as Sharon can attest, is to, have, to handle grievances and to go to meetings. This is not the union we have had for the last two years. Now, when an issue arises, I can call our president and she can deal with it immediately in a way that creates the least amount of disruption for our students. Please reconsider your position, agree to support your employees, and negotiate the full-time release of our president so that we can continue to be an exemplar to other districts and move forward in the spirit of collaboration. Thank you for your time. My name is Julie Spencer Robinson. I live at 248 Spring Grove Avenue and I'm president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. Tonight, I ask that you reconsider our proposal for full-time release of the NACE president so that the association and district leaders can continue working together in ways that benefit our students, their families, and our staff. I made the decision to run for NACE president because I wanted to create collaborative structures in the Northampton Public Schools that would provide opportunities for teacher leadership, bring teacher voices into district discussions about educational policies and practices, and offer stability throughout any changes in district staff. The foundation for the kind of collaboration I envisioned had already been laid by some of you, as well as your predecessors and mine. The teacher contract had language for a joint labor management professional development committee, but the committee didn't exist. There was an educator evaluation committee, but all they could really do was review new DESE mandates and pass them along to teachers. The school committee and the association were moving away from a positional bargaining model, but it was a short list of items negotiated. At last year's convocation, Mayor Narkowitz introduced me as the incredible union president. That was high praise. If I am incredible, it's because full-time release has given me the opportunity to build the capacity of our organization, working with an incredible association leadership team and with a superintendent who embraces collaboration. Together, we brought the Joint Labor Management Professional Development Committee into existence, made PD more relevant to teachers' practice, and included ESPs on the committee. We work to make the educator evaluation system more meaningful and manageable for teachers and administrators alike. We made substantial changes to six collective bargaining agreements and raised the wage floor for our lowest paid workers. We achieved real progress on the district improvement plan. We began developing an ESP to teacher career path. I love this work and I want to do more. In the next year, I want to lead negotiations for a home visit program and help ensure that it's launched successfully. I want to continue to represent Northampton on the Diverse Teacher Workforce Coalition and negotiate a new ESP pay grid so that we can take concrete steps toward a teaching staff that more closely resembles the diversity of our student body. I want to facilitate the shift in educator evaluation indicators to ones that are aligned with a full inclusion teaching model. And I want to support the six NACE MPS chapter coordinators in their roles to foster the best possible conditions for teaching, for working, and for learning. If I return to the classroom, I will only have time for the most essential of union business. I understand and appreciate that there may be a cost to the district of my release, including the disruption of having a teacher on leave from her position. 
I contend that the benefits to our district of full-time release fully outweigh these costs, and I urge you to support it. Good evening. My name is Cindy Womatt, and I live at 72 Parsons Hill Drive in Conway, Mass. I'm the chapter coordinator for Unit D of the Northampton Association of School Employees at Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School. I am here tonight to address the concern that Smith Vocational Board of Trustees rejected the proposal finan proposed financial contribution to the full-time release during negotiations. The reason that Unit D did not push this full-time release denial was that Unit D was asked to increase our workday by 25 minutes. As you can imagine, this was a big deal for the membership and took precedent over almost everything else. Negotiations were very difficult, and at the end of the 2016 school year, we agreed to put negotiations on hold until September. Our then superintendent told us the last day of school that he was quitting. Also, to make things more interesting, the Board of Trustees lawyer and our MTA representative both retired. So we started the 2017 school year with a new Board of Trustees lawyer, a new MTA rep, and a new interim superintendent. His name is Kevin Farr, and he was wonderful, by the way. Both sides resubmitted and reviewed all the original requests, but it was quickly agreed to by everyone that due to the enormous impact of the 25 additional minutes, the impact of both student learning and curriculum, that several other issues were not going to be discussed. However, we are going to resubmit these issues again, and we will be requesting that the Smith Vocational Board of Trustees contribute to the full-time release of the President. Thank you. Nelly. Good evening, members of the school committee. My name is Nellie Donahue. I live at 1 King Ave in Florence. Um, I am a parent of an incoming Ryan Road kindergartner, for which I am overjoyed. Um, and I'm also a teacher in the East Hampton Public Schools for nearly a decade now. I have been extremely active in the East Hampton Education Association and um, within the Mass Teachers Association. Um, and I, I value that work all equally, the parenting, the teaching, and the activism. Um, so I, I want to express my support for the collaboration that's been happening for the last two years between the board and NACE um, around the release of the, of the, uh, the full-time release of the president from teaching duties. I, I think that um, there has been an ability for the person who's occupying that position to resolve local issues before they come to grievance. However, I think there's other bigger factors that we all need to consider, and I bring those to you as a concerned community member and a concerned American. Um, I think that the full-time release position for the president is going to allow for the knitting together of uh, NACE members within and between schools. I also um, view that position as um, a vehicle for collaboration with other locals in the area who have similar concerns. Um, I, I think it's important for that person to also bring um, a connection between the local issues that are a concern to us all as citizens of the city and a connection between things that are operating on the state level. We exist in a political climate right now with an extreme onslaught of attack on the public education system and I am concerned and I want to do what we can as a community to strengthen our local school system as much as possible. Um, I'm extremely concerned about the charter and voucher issues um, and privatization. I'm also concerned about the destabilization of our local um, teacher unions and really all labor unions in the, within the country. And I think that this issue is in, uh, speaks to that directly. <coughs> so um, I, I want our city to have a strong working relationship between the school board and the, teacher, and the teachers union. I think it's vital for the success of all of our students and to present to the city, the state, the nation, that Northampton is a place where public education is valued and where people from opposing uh, constituencies are willing to work together to come to mutually beneficial agreements. So with that said, while it's natural for there to be conflicting issues between the school committee and NACE, I urge you to hash those out at the bargaining table and come to a stronger labor management agreement on this issue so that there can be a valuable release position for the NACE president in the next year and in the future. Thank you.
Karen. Good evening. My name is Karen Schiaffo. I live at 211 Spring Grove Avenue in Florence. And I am here to ask you to reconsider your decision to eliminate the full-time release NACE president. As a member of NACE, a nurse at JFK Middle School, a building delegate, and a member of the negotiation team for two <coughs> contract cycles, I have directly seen the benefit of having this position. I can appreciate the difficulty of the task set before you as school committee members during these tight budget times. I am not clear, though, how the elimination of this position will help save dollars. However, I'd like to address how the benefits do outweigh any disadvantages. As you may realize, teachers' unions continue to play a vital role in the health and well-being of our schools, the staff members who work in them, and the children we serve. A strong union helps to create workplaces that attract and retain great teachers and staff, as well as having great learning conditions for students. Strong collaborative unions cannot exist without having someone at the helm ready to address issues promptly and collaborate with administration regarding innovation, innovative practices that serve to benefit students. Staff are not available during the workday and do this important work after school hours. Often, other commitments can prevent staff from engaging in these pursuits. A full-time release president is available to do this work and communicate information to members in a timely fashion. It is vital that teachers and staff have a voice. Any innovation cannot possibly succeed when they are left out of the decision-making process. If there is no buy-in, administration cannot effectively move anything forward. The essentials of a good education are the same everywhere. A rigorous curriculum, effective instruction, adequate resources, willing students, and a social and cultural climate in which education is encouraged and respected. NACE must work in collaboration with administration to make these essentials available for every student. I ask for your support in reestablishing the position of the full-time release president to make this possible. Thank you for your time. That's all the people I have signed up on the list. Is there anyone else that didn't sign up that wishes to speak this evening? Come on forward, and once again, if you'd state your name and your address for the record. Hi, my name is Mary Clark. I live at 183 Riverside Drive in Florence. Thank you for being here. I'm not actually sure if this is when I should be speaking or at another time. So bear with me, but I'm here as a representative of J uh, Jackson Street Schools PTO, <coughs> and I'm calling to say I'm sorry that we didn't ask for permission in the proper way for our new mural. Sorry. Um, now, as of now, Brenda Lilly, our art teacher, knows that we need to ask permission, and Sean Green, the artist, and now the rest of the PTO knows. So if we do more murals, We've got it covered now, all right? Proper process. In terms of this mural, which is gorgeous, if you haven't seen it, go on Facebook, to our Facebook site, or go by Jackson Street and see it. It's absolutely gorgeous. It, the PTO donated $700, so we need to ask permission to have given that as a gift. And um, we put something on the outside of the school, so we are retroactively asking permission for that. And we got a great grant from the Northampton Arts Council, and Royal Talons donated all of the supplies, over $500 worth of painting supplies. So if those are included as part of the gift, then I ask for permission. Is there something else you need of me? It's our custom not to address um, during public comment. So sorry. <coughs> Okay, should I stay? You can't tell me. You can, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe move to the, to to the right if I'm to stay to do this on the agenda. Can you move in response? No. Okay. Okay. Yeah, stick so, around. Stick around. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Okay, seeing and hearing none, then we'll move on to our recommended. Uh, well, first of all, we have 
announcements? Any announcements this evening? Can we announce that it's letter O on our agenda? <laughs> <laughs> Mary Clark. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it may be worth noting that um, if, if there are interested uh, potential school committee people looking to um, take out nomination papers, I believe they are due by the end of the month, July 24th, is it? Or it's 27th? 27th, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Not sure. The end of the month. So um, there's still a couple of weeks, so if you are interested, please consider going down to City Hall, the City Clerk's Office, and getting some papers. Okay, moving on uh, to our recommended actions. We have a vote by consent agenda, approval of minutes, school committee meeting January. Oh, that's not my wife calling. That's, oh, Time maybe it is. is. No. <laughs> Time's up. You've Time to come home. Minutes. <laughs> okay. So, back to the consent agenda, uh, approval of minutes, school committee meeting January 12th, I believe that is June 12th, or it is January 12th, okay. January 12th, 2017, budget and property subcommittee meeting June 14th, 2017, rules and policy subcommittee meeting June 23rd, 2017, superintendent evaluation team meeting June 27th, 2017, Negotiating subcommittee meeting June 29th, 2017. We have a budget transfer approval, NHS clerical budget transfer to align with the DESI reporting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. I could I ask that we change the agenda and move item O to the beginning of the list? Oh, second. <laughs> there's been a, a request, a motion, and a second to move item O up in the agenda, so we will take that first. I would just first also say that this is traditionally the time when um, we would have a report from the high school, and we have Elena with us this evening, but because the high school is not in session, she will not be making a report. But we're glad you're here. Yes, my report is that the high school is not currently in session. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so right. thank you. Concluded. <laughs> okay. So we do have a vote here, a gift. Uh, Northam Arts Council in Jackson Street PTO in the amount of $300 to Jackson Street School for the creation of a mural. Yes. And I guess we just heard the value is actually much more than 300 I think I just heard 1500 total. Mm -hmm value between the arts lottery <coughs> um, grant the PTO donation and the materials that were donated so we can correct this to the $1,200 value um, it originally came to you being a gift under a thousand dollars because of your policy that says any permanent changes to the structure need to be approved by the school committee which was the reference I think earlier tonight so we brought it forward for your approval of placement of the mural as well as acceptance of the gift accept this gift and authorize placement of the mural. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? Second. <laughs> I, discussion? I have one question. Sure. Discussion? Okay. Ms. Clark, where exactly is the mural? Um, it's, if you, um, okay. Do you know where the, if you're, at, if the Miss Agna playground is here, uh -huh. and the school is here, uh -huh. and fourth and fifth graders pick up right here, uh -huh. Um, there's a wall here that's used for ball ball and a wall on that side that's used yep. for ball ball on the side of the garden. It's on this side. Gotcha. Right. So on the, Thanks. On the back wall on ball back, wall? It faces in. It facing is, the old playground. It, does, it actually doesn't face the playground That's what it looks like. Oh, if cool. I was a mural, ahead of me would be the backs of the people who live on Bridgeview. Oh, okay, got it. So, <laughs> so uh -huh. are they allowed to play wall ball? Um, yes, it doesn't use it, but they generally now pretty much, in, I think, the wall wall guys prefer the other side by the garden mm -hmm. rather than this wall for wall wall. And we may have to make a, a, a school recommendation about wall wall on that wall. Although wall wall is usually lower than where the mural is. Thanks. Um, 
The mural is pretty high <coughs> up, and it's made out of a fabric um, that should endure anything and has been painted over um, by a protective coat. But I, um, I, since we suddenly moved this up, I also need to disclose that my husband is the person, Sean Green was the person who was involved in this, so I was gonna step away from this vote. Um, if I step away from this vote, do we have uh, enough people? To, I was in no way involved in this, but I also don't want to. Um, mm -hmm. I can't, you yeah, I need to fully disclose it. You can just abstain. I can abstain, excellent. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Me. <laughs> abstention? One abstention. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. All right, so we'll go back up to the top. Um, we have a report, and it's a report of the superintendent evaluation team, and I will turn it over to Ms. Hennessy. And a vote. And, and a vote, yeah. yes, of course. And a vote after she speaks. So after um, members of the committee know, but also for the public, uh, the evaluation process is a long process for teachers, administrator, administrators, and obviously the superintendent. And so Mr. Zahowski, Mr. Kaufman, and I met with uh, Dr. Provost um, to go over the four standards in the evaluation, the state evaluation, and the many elements. Um, he presented evidence on the power elements, is that what we'll say? Um, and those were only uh, a few, but those, on, those few elements still took more than 80 pages of evidence. Um, in addition to that, um, teachers, about 27 teachers completed a survey. Other teachers contacted us, parents, um, some students, um, and then some obviously s school committee members contacted either Mr. Zahowski, me, or Mr. Kaufman. And so we met on 22nd of June. We went over each of the standards in detail and rated each um, each element and ultimately those of you on the committee have read this came up with an overall rating of proficient our, that's our recommendation and um, so that's what we're asking to vote on and then each of the four standards which are instructional leadership we voted proficient uh, and that's our recommendation management and operations exemplary standard three family and community engagement proficient and standard four professional culture proficient um, we had a lot of discussion. It was a few hours of a meeting, three more than that. Um, and uh, we had a lot of, I think, great conversations and discussed a lot of evidence that Dr. Provost presented, that we presented and added. Um, so tonight I bring you that vote, um, a vote of proficient for the overall summative rating for Dr. Provost. So we do have a vote here on the superintendent's summative evaluation. Is there a motion to uh, uh, approve, uh, to accept the mm -hmm. superintendent's summative evaluation? Sure, I will make the motion that we accept the superintendent's summative evaluation as proposed by the superintendent evaluation subcommittee. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or <coughs> questions? Okay, seeing or hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Next we have a vote, uh, a resolution calling for the implementation of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations. And I'll turn that over to Ms. Busansky. Thank you. So uh, Ms. Fallon actually brought this to my attention, but since she's not here this at this meeting, I said I would be happy to present it. So. On July 25th, there's a legislative hearing of the Joint Committee on Education, and they are specifically looking on at the issue of school finance. And uh, there have been numerous, actually right now I think it's over 40 school committees that have passed this resolution calling for the implementation of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations. So I'm asking everyone tonight to approve this so we can join and um, be a part of this movement obviously this is for moving forward we understand 
huge you know budget issues the governor's considering um, this year's budget so we'd be looking towards the future to have it kind of fully implemented so but this is really so we could have this in place in time for this July 25th meeting so would you like me to read it for the public I know everyone else here has read it I hope so resolution <coughs> calling for the implementation of the foundation budget review Commission's recommendations whereas the Constitution of the Commonwealth 1780 requires it shall be the duty of legislatures and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences public schools and grammar schools in the towns and whereas mcduffie versus secretary of the executive office of education 1993 declared the massachusetts constitution imposes an enforceable duty on the magistrates and legislatures of this commonwealth to provide education in the public schools for the children they're enrolled, whether they be rich or poor and without regard to the fiscal capacity of the community or district in which such children live. It shall be declared also that the constitutional duty is not being currently fulfilled by the Commonwealth. And whereas Hancock versus the Commissioner of Education 2005 concluded, I do not suggest that the goals of education reform adopted since McDuffie have been fully achieved. Clearly they have not. Nothing I say today would insulate the Commonwealth from a successful challenge under the Education Clause in different circumstances. And whereas the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center report Cutting Class 2011 found the real value of the original foundation budget has eroded significantly over time due in large part to rapid cost growth for health care and special education. Since the foundation budget's original design did not foresee this rapid cost growth, spending reductions have been forced in other key areas, especially regular education teachers. And whereas the Foundation Budget Review Commission 2015 resolved the good work begun by the Education Reform Act of 1993 and the educational progress made since will be at risk so long as our school systems are fiscally strained by the ongoing failure to substantive, substantively reconsider the adequacy of the foundation budget. Therefore, we, the Northampton School Committee, petition the 190th General Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to implement without further delay, in full, the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission. We have some motions. I'll second that motion. <laughs> so there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Next, we have another vote. Uh, this is a budget transfer to increase the IT technician position. Ms. Walzak? Yes, our Director of Technology, or the City's Chief Information Officer, has requested that we allow a transfer of $9,000 from the Student Technology Helper account into the Computer Tech Salary account. What we're doing as we restructure the IT department, as we've talked about throughout the budget process, is try to put more technical support for the teachers where we think it would be needed the best. And we have not been able to, in the last couple of years, use the student helpers to the degree that we thought. They're limited by hours. They're limited by availability to get around to the buildings. So his plan is still to have some student helpers. He's got a couple working this summer and would continue some through the school year. But he'd like to move some of that money to add it to the funds that we currently have available for a half-time position that's vacant um, and increase it to a 0.7 position. And in addition to the help desk duties, also assign some of the same duties that our two technicians have. So we have a staff of 2.7 people that are out there able to resolve the different hardware and software issues in the buildings. I'll move to approve the budget transfer to increase the IT technician position. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, we have a vote. Uh, it's a budget transfer to restructure the technology specialist position. Yes, this is coming jointly from the IT department and the special ed department. We currently have a vacancy of a 0.5 assistive technology position, and we'd like to restructure how those services are done and also put some additional supports into the high school. We currently have tech integration specialists at the elementary and middle school levels, but no one in that position at the high school. So by rearranging some of the 
salary funds from the assistive technology position along with using some of the funds that become available because of a recent award of E-rate monies. Um, we like to put those together and change the assistive technology position into a technology integration specialist at the high school. It would remain a .5 FTE but just have a different concentration of duties. To step aside for a second, the E-rate funds our monies that we were notified about a week ago that we received um, to support our internet, internet access cost. Hmm. So we had originally funded those in our budget because you never know with the E-rate if and when you will receive funding. So by receiving the funding for 50% of our internet access costs, those are the funds that the IT director is recommending we transfer to fund this position. So moved. Any discussion, yeah, questions? I got a yeah. question. So the the assistive technology thing was primarily for special education purposes. Yes. Is the idea that that our current, um, you know, sort of technology in the schools, people like says Sarah McLaughlin, and and then the uh, the various integration people will will fill the same role. Yes. That oh, that'll be sorry, sorry not Sarah. Right. Molly. Not Sarah. Yeah. She's a famous singer. Yeah, Molly. <laughs> I didn't know Molly McLaughlin was a famous singer. <laughs> Molly McLaughlin was a famous singer. <laughs> Molly and the tech integration specialist. Some of that work is similar to what they're already doing for other classes, so it would basically concentrate all that into the tech integration specialist at each building. Okay. Just weighing on that a little bit. Um, I think there are a couple of other factors to, in play. One is as we move towards a more universal design for instruction. Um, we've purchased a number of um, software packages that are just available to all students. These are things that formerly you would do an assistive technology evaluation for and then um, have provided through the IEP process. So we're more and more just providing supports to all students, which re um, reduces the amount of that um, individual assistive tech um, kind of planning. We will continue um, to provide um, some assistive tech assessments for kids who have highly individual needs um, through a contracted position, but we don't have the need to maintain a half-time position to do that. So just to be sure that I understand, so we're using monies that we've gotten through this E-rate? We're using funds that we are redirecting because we no longer need to pay 50% of our internet access bills. The way the E-rate program works is after you go through a very complicated process and get approval, the federal government actually pays your vendor mm, the gotcha. portion of the bill you're approved for. So if we have a, for example, a monthly bill of $2,000 for internet access, the federal government will pay our vendor $1,000 a month and we'll mm -hmm. be billed just the remaining 1000 so we had, in that example, we had budgeted the full $2,000 a month. So now we now have money in that account that we can transfer for this purpose. For paying the salary. Yes. And if we don't get that E-rate money next year, are we going to be in a position to have to reconsider it this? Has, uh, the IT director does not. He thinks within other areas of the budget, he would also be able to do something to fund this also. Okay. Thanks. Any other discussion? Okay. It's been... Second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Very good. We've got another vote. Uh, lots of votes tonight. Um, we've got a job description for board certified behavior analyst, Dr. Provost. Thank you. This is the first of a series of four votes on job descriptions, as you point out. So uh, let me just say some <coughs> preliminary remarks that apply to all of them. Um, just in case you're wondering, these job descriptions have been reviewed by NACE. They've been um, negotiated where negotiation was necessary to resolve issues with NACE. And I, I um, just want you to know that you're voting on things that will not cause problems down the line with the association. First, um, the board certified behavior analyst is a position that currently exists within the district. It, this, um, this job description is just being modified to reflect the more um, update require, updated requirements of the job. One thing I will point out that came up when we were putting together the job description is if you look at the bargaining unit, it says NACE Unit A. Currently, the BCBA is not in the recognition clause of Unit A. However, the individual who is in this role has been 
receiving the pay and benefits of Unit I. So, and I do think it makes sense for it to be a Unit A position, but that's something that would have to be negotiated between NACE and the committee at some point. Move to accept this job description of the board certified. Is there a second? Any discussion, questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, this is really picky, and I'm sorry I didn't bring this up before the meeting. And, um, just the, a simple question. Under required qualifications and skills, you have two that are preferred, and I'm wondering if that's something in the future you would want to put required and then preferred as a separate category, or do you, does that make sense? Sure. I, don't, I think it's picky, but yeah. I'm picky. I guess. Do you want it? Is it preferred? No, I guess is it preferred or is it required? Is my first question. Um, it is preferred. When when you see the preferred underneath a or next to a qualification underneath the required qualification mm -hmm. section, it's basically meant sort of as a modifier to that. Okay. Saying it's not absolutely required, yeah. but if we had a candidate who did have that, they obviously would be yeah. would be considered uh, more favorably than someone who didn't. Yeah, I get that. I just okay. structurally for me, but I don't. Need, it doesn't need to change. I'm totally fine. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. On to the next job description. This is for education team liaison. So in this situation, again, we are updating the job description at the last school committee meeting we transferred funds to create an ETL position at the middle school in the process of moving forward to post that we reviewed the job description as we typically do so this um, reflects the more current understanding of what the requirements for the ETL will be this also has been um, written to be a um, sort of broadly enough written job description so that it could anticipate ETLs coming in at every level. Um, so we don't, even though the, the transfer was for middle school only, this would cover, we believe, ETL work at high school, middle, and elementary school if we're ever in the position of being able to add those positions. or adopt this job description for educational team liaison. Is there a second? Second. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. We've got another job description. This one is for early childhood outreach coordinator. Okay, this is the one with the most moving parts because, pardon? Specialist, sorry. This still is the one with the, the most moving parts <coughs> because this is not only a job description change but also sort of a reorganization within early childhood and special education. And it is somewhat complicated so I'm gonna to refer to my notes. Um, so one thing you need to, bear in mind to understand how the job description is um, crafted is where funding for the position will come from. So a, a good portion of the funding for this position is intended to come from the Coordinated Family and Community Engagement CFCE grant. That grant is currently used to fund a large portion of Barbara Black's salary. Um, in the reorganization of special education supervision services, we see a number of the CFCE roles um, moving off of the ad administrator who's going to probably be identified to work more with younger kids. And um, so we will only be retaining probably point one of that position being funded by CFCE. That limits the work the person can do because the CFCE funds need to be used for CFCE direct activities. So that frees up money that we would use to put towards this position. So we currently have a person in the district who's working essentially um, three different roles. The person is about 0.2 CFCE, 0.3 ETL, and 0.5 preschool teacher. What we would do is consolidate um, the 
job requirements there, take that person out of the classroom, have that person do about 80% CFCE activities and the, re the remaining 20% ETL activities. And as a result of all this reorganization, an additional $20,000 is freed up, which would be used to replace the half-time preschool teaching that that person is also doing. So um, all of that is goes really is financial rather than job description related, but to understand why we're doing this and how it works, I think that's relevant. I move to accept the job description for the early childhood oh, outreach court. No, sorry, early childhood outreach specialist. Second. Second. Any discussion, questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, and we have a job description for a mentor coordinator. And this one is really the easiest. Um, mentor coordinator is responsible for implementing the mentoring that all initial educators or educators on initial licenses need to receive within their first five years of employment in order to be able to advance their licenses. We have a um, long established mentoring program in the district and the person who is currently heading that is retiring so we need to replace that as we went to post that we realized we didn't have a job description so this just memorializes the work already being done doesn't reflect any changes i move to accept the job description of mentor coordinator second any discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye Opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? Okay. Great. That does it for the job descriptions. Now we're on to some gifts. Uh, we have a vote here. Uh, gift Jackson Street PTO in the amount of $4,000 for uh, kindergarten grade one playground upgrades. Ms. Walzak. Yes, the PTO would like to make a donation to be able to um, make a number of improvements to the kindergarten and first grade playground, including an upgraded sandbox, water table, art stations, and improvements to the existing playhouse. Move to accept this gift. Second. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? We have a gift from Stop and Shop in the amount of $5,532.87 to Northampton High School. Ms. Walzak. Yes, this is actually a gift that we're very fortunate to get every year. It's a result of Stop and Shop's um, A-plus awards program where a percentage of sales comes back. The high school has traditionally, at least for the last couple of years, um, deposited half of that donation amount, it varies each year, into the athletic gift account and half into the high school's general gift account. This year their intent is to use a substantial portion of the general gift account for the senior class activity, the trip to High Meadows this year. I move to accept the gift from Stop and Shop in the amount of $5,532.87 to Northampton High School. Second that. Questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? Okay, we'll accept that with gratitude <coughs> as we accept all of them. Um, the next, we have a gift. Uh, this is NHS PTO in the amount of $5,500 to Northam High School for AP test fee assistance. Ms. Walzak. Yes, if we go back to the budget process, we were notified right as we were doing the budget that the federal program that subsidized the advanced placement exams for high school students was going away or changing. There were a lot of questions around how that would work. We had originally put this amount of money, which was an estimate from the high school on what it would cost for the exams for the um, low income, free and reduced price students to take the exams. Um, the mayor had suggested that we remove that from our budget and he would assist with getting donations that could actually underwrite that cost next year. That has come through. The donations did get directed to the PTO who is now ready to donate that to us so that we have the funds available for the exam next year. Uh, related to that, to let you know, we don't know why, but this year somehow the federal funds must have worked their way to the college board because when we received the invoice recently to pay for this year's advanced placement exams, there was a credit 
on there for low income students so that we did not have to actually subsidize it out of our budget in FY17, which had not been budgeted. So we don't know what will continue in the future, but this gives us a cushion if the funding completely goes away, we'll have money earmarked just for these exams. Move to accept this gift, 5,500 for AP test fee assistance. Second. Any questions or discussion? I just want to sincerely thank the PTO for stepping up and giving this money. I think it it's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of money for the PTO to be donating. Um, hugely grateful to them, and I just think we should be considering how costly these exams are um, and the kind of burden that we're placing on our PTOs and our community members and our city budget. I'm just curious, uh, Superintendent, I guess I'm sort of following up. <coughs> on what you've just said, Ms. Fragamini, but um, is, do you know if the high school is, I know this whole issue raised a lot of questions about who's taking, you know, the requirement of taking the AP, when is it useful, when is it not? Do you have any idea if the high school is considering that question or? I would say it's a perennial discussion at the high school with extremely strong feelings on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, there are some uh, teachers who strongly believe that the AP requirement they're taking the AP test requirement for being enrolled in AP classes should be abandoned because it creates um, disincentives for students and there are some students who don't actually care for the AP credit and so they, they basically go and waste time during the testing period. Mm -hmm. um, there are others who feel that the AP test requirement holds a high standard of academic rigor that they and the, the students value and don't want to give up. So I don't feel that, um, if you asked me to sort of handicap it, I would say it's a 50-50. I don't think there is a strong um, movement either to um, change the policy or even modify the policy because I don't think that there's a, um, a majority of teachers or at least a strong enough block even within any of the departments to, to change policy at the high school. But I would say there is a strong and um, uh, frequently heard from minority of teachers who do feel that it's wrong to require kids to take the test. Do you know if there's a policy at the high school for the principal to make exceptions that students don't have to take it? I believe the handbook requires students enrolled to take it. Um, Regardless. Right. Okay. I'm not going to say that there's never been an exception made, I mean, just because I would never mm -hmm. you know, make that kind of statement. But um, the, the <coughs> handbook and the course catalog does require students currently enrolled in AP classes to sign up for the AP test. Mm -hmm. Do I have to be recognized? Yeah. Um, I, I will say to Ms. Wiesanski's question that the student union this past year um, took it up as one of our issues that we are working on. Um, and the past year we conducted polls among students um, and we're currently working on analyzing that data with our new crew of student union members and it will be one of our issues moving forward. And we hope to work with the school's administration and you all to look at these costs and the policies. Great, thanks. Just to add one piece to it, just because the, the invoice came in yesterday with the credits for this year. So for this year, we actually administered 595 AP exams. Substantial. Sure Any other comments? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We have a vote uh, on a gift from Smith College, some used IMAX to the district. Ms. Walzak. Yes, Smith College has again reached out to us to make a donation of computer technology that they are taking out of their inventory and offering it to us to use. Um, they are donating approximately 12 iMac computers and two printers, and our IT department is requesting that we accept this gift so that we can integrate them into our programs. So moved. Second. Any discussion? As a student in the tech department and at the high school as a whole, these computers from Smith College are so important and super helpful. Um, and it's just a fantastic addition to our technology infrastructure. So thank you to them. Do we know where they end up? I mean, how they are distributed, or is it at, the department at, that 
decides? The IT department will decide at this point with the equipment they ordered at the close of the year two. I don't think they've made decisions where everything will be located, Jim. Any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. We've got a gift uh, for Northampton High School uh, PTO in the amount of $2,675 in teacher grants. Yes, this consists of three different grants. Uh, they, I believe they called these their spring grants. There was $1,000 um, for, it's listed here as stipends, it's actually hourly pay, but for the cutoff guard advisors to do some additional programming of, above what they had originally done. There's $675 for the academic team to travel to the national competition in Atlanta, Georgia. And there's $1,000 for books for several of our special ed and ELL programs at the high school, books that will be placed in the library for the students' uses for a total gift of $2,675. So moved. Second. Second. Questions, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next, we have a gift um, from Dr. Melvin Hershowitz in the amount of $100,000 to the Bridge Street School Library. Ms. Walzak. Yes, I think we have to say the amazingly generous Dr. Melvin Herkowitz. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember in the past, he's donated money for the playground renovation and money for technology in the building. Mm -hmm. And he came forward again this year to the principal and offered to make a $100,000 donation to let us proceed with the renovations to the library that were actually presented to you probably six or eight months ago. So this is a very generous donation. I don't think we can thank him enough for what he's done for Bridge Street School. School library wholeheartedly and with great appreciation. Second. Any discussion or questions? So I remember in that presentation there was a foundation that was going to provide that those funds, and then we ran up we ran up against a time barrier and it didn't work out. What happens with the any idea what happens with the foundation moving forward? There. As far as we know at this, this point, I, th and I think because their timeline for that donation had uh -huh. lapsed, as far as I know, they are not still looking to do anything, but they're always welcome to come back mm -hmm. okay. in the future. I just didn't know where they... Yeah. Um, they needed to use that or grant by a certain time. maybe we know another elementary school <laughs> that needs a new library. I don't know. <laughs> the do. thought. Maybe, maybe there are three <laughs> more. I don't know. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We've got a vote uh, on a gift. Northam Arts Council in Jackson Street PTO in the amount of $300 to Jackson Street School for the creation of, oh, we already did that one. Okay. <laughs> yep. And, but we do have another one down here. We've got uh, P. So. We have got a gift here for Northampton High School PTO, $4,000 to fine and performing arts department. Ms. Walzak. Yes, this was money that the PTO raised through the Valley Gives fundraiser probably a month or so ago. Um, these, this, these funds will be donated to the um, arts programs predominantly for use of supplies for the programs. Accept this gift from the PTO. Your second. Second. Discussion. Well, not, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I just I, I'm sitting here. <coughs> these are this is a lot of um, contributions to the district, and um, I, I, I am very grateful for them. And at the same time, a little bit, you know, um, chastened that you know we are unable to provide. Most of these are things which a, a school district should be able to finance, and and it gets back to our original early agenda item of full funding of the uh, foundation budget would just be a start on being able to f do these things um, directly as a district. Point, point well made. Yeah, I agree, and I think this is over $122,000 is amazing, and this is just this meeting. 
Um, but I do think it's incumbent upon us as a committee to continue to think about this and look at it um, in terms of equity among the schools. Because I do, uh, I have a concern. And this is wonderful and lovely, but I, I think we have to recognize that in our community, not each district has the capacity to raise this mu many funds and uh, their PTOs. And so some schools are getting some stuff that's wonderful, and, and they should. Like, I don't know the solution to this, but I do think it's, we have to be aware of this, and we have to, we're getting to that point where we're not being funded, the state's not funding us, certainly the federal government's not, and we need to, to have harder discussions, I think. Yes. So I'm just making that comment. Um, I love that you brought that up, and I, I really, really agree. And I think um, it feels as if, as a district, actually, we really, like, the community of schools is moving toward that themselves and finding ways to collaborate or finding mm -hmm. places that we can pool our resources to distribute equitably. And it really seems like a conversation that's been going on yeah. that, that we can continue and spearhead. I, I really, really thank you for bringing it up. Okay, so we have a vote on the table here to accept a gift. Um, there's been a motion made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Well, that wraps up a bunch of gifts. Portion of tonight's job program. <laughs> yes, and we'll move into letter Q, which is reports, and we have reports from the Rules and Policies Subcommittee. They've been vi busy and we have some first readings to go through this evening. Ms. Hennessy. Well, hello. Ms. <laughs> um, Fallon is not here today, so my, my name is here, but I'm sure Mr. Reed will also help me in this, and Ms. Jarvis Vance will help more than anyone. Um, we have five readings, or five, four readings and a discussion, which we'll talk about the discussion later. And the first reading is the non-discrimination on the basis of transgender and gender non-conforming status. Um, and this, um, Ms. Jarvis Vance informed the subcommittee that there had been a task force working on this concerning uh, transgender and gender non-conforming students. And this is a brand new policy. It is a, uh, unseen in Massachusetts. And yeah, as far, well, I, yeah, I haven't seen it. And then, um, so if you have any questions, I think just here, here we have it. <laughs> so I guess I, I'll just say this is um, just one piece of work that's come out of that task force that's been working for about two years with representation from um, elementary, middle, and high school levels. So, and I have my my folder that looks like the organization of all the <laughs> work that we've done. And it's in two basic areas around policies or frameworks and foundations and then practices. And we've also had a third kind of prong which is around training. So we have developed um, handbook language that is now in all the, the handbooks. Um, we have looked at all the existing policies to make sure that they include gender identity as one of the protected categories. We have um, had a lot of training going on um, throughout the district at all the levels, and that will continue. The next thing we're really going to look at is supporting teachers around classroom practices and trying to kind of de-gender a lot of the things that we've been doing in education for a very long time. Um, and so this is what we felt, and we also, we did develop other tools um, for use by principals, assistant principals, guidance counselors, when you have a student or a parent come and disclose that their child or themselves is transitioning or questioning. Um, we have a, I, a review guide that helps us go through all the places in a school environment where this could be an issue or needs to be addressed. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we've really, we developed um, a Q&A for teachers, um, which is shared in a shared drive at the high school level, but can certainly go further. That really addresses a lot of the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty of the day-to-day -day life of a student who is transgender, gender nonconforming, questioning in a school environment. So this policy piece was kind of the last thing we really 
really felt that even though our anti-discrimination policies do include gender identity as a protected category, <coughs> this there was a lot more to it, um, and especially where after the, the federal support kind of got rolled back, even though in the state there is very strong support for students, um, we felt that it would be really important for our district to make a stand and very clearly show what we support, what we value, um, and what we intend to, to do for students and, and staff. So that's kind of where we're at. We had to pretty much develop it from scratch because there's not a lot out there to build on. There's no MASC sample policy to go from. So here you have it. It has uh, been through the attorney. Go ahead. Dr. Provost. <laughs> As Ms. Jarvis Van said, we did have to build it from scratch. Um, and I really want to recognize one of the builders who's not here tonight mm -hmm. who had a lot of, put a lot of work into this, Celeste Malvezzi from the high school. Um, as Karen said, that group is wide ranging and representative of uh, all the buildings, but I know that this was an especially important um, policy for Ms. Malvezzi. And so I, she's not here tonight. I just want to recognize her. Absolutely. Thank you. And I was remiss not to. Um, so I first want to say I am just so, so blown away and impressed that our district is, you know, considering adopting this policy and took all this time writing it up and developing a task force. I think as a student in our public schools, it's always just been like something that you hear this, this level of acceptance um, among teachers too, but to have it actually um, you know, codified and written down is really incredible. So thank you for your work. Um, I did have a question. Um, in the policy, it states that the responsibility for determining a student's gender identity rests with the student and or with the parent guardian in the case of young students not able to advocate for themselves. Right. Did you guys develop like a some sort of age where that no, seems like? No, really have to leave it open because it is very much on a case by case basis. So we've had very young children that are, are very clear <coughs> and, and very, very vocal. <coughs> Um, and other young children that really do need a parent to, to help advocate for them. So we really did need to leave that very general. And we, every student, every family is on a case-by-case -case basis because every student and every family's needs are different. It's so far that there's not one template that's gonna work for everybody. Thank you. Yep. This, this is a question. You know, it's like one of these things where when you look at a what you think is a small group, and it raises a question about sort of the general practice for the last hundred years. Um, so, in any gender segregated facility, any student who's uncomfortable using a shared facility shall provide with a safe and non stigmatizing alternative. You know, my, my recollection of middle school and high school was that most people were uncomfortable using the locker room, <laughs> regardless of gender, gender nonconformity, regardless. I think most people were uncomfortable using the locker room. And um, so I guess I, you know, that particular piece of the policy makes me wonder if, um, you know, if, if, we are, if we actually have the physical plant to be able to follow through on a policy which says that any student who's uncomfortable using a shared facility shall be provided with a safe and non-stigmatizing alternative. So far, we, we have been. And I will say, too, we don't change into uniforms anymore for that purpose. When I went to middle school, we had to change into a uniform. And these days, we don't even require students to change for physical education. Mm -hmm. So generally, um, at, at the middle school, they may be because they do have swimming. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the one exception. And swimming is always can be problematic for some. And we, we, we've handled that up to this point. So up to this point. This is not anything new. This is what we're already doing. Well, well, in a way, though, it is new because I don't think we have any policy that says if anybody's uncomfortable in the shared facility, we will mm -hmm. provide it. Yep. I don't think we've said that before. Perhaps not in a policy, but it's been our practice, and it has been in the, in the handbook language. So we have been doing this, and we have had shared uh, neutral spaces, and it has been working so far. Rebecca, you go ahead. Okay. Um, I really, really, really want to thank everybody who is involved in this. This is huge and um, such a testament to um, 
taking action on what we believe in as a community. Um, I also see um, that uh, when we put out a policy like this, it will immediately require um, a lot of outreach and education mm -hmm. to the community who might have a variety of feelings um, about this. Um, and it, it connects to some, you know, some other things that have been going on in the district as well around sexual har harassment and just about our bodies and who we are and gender and a lot of stuff. And I really embrace this opportunity because I think what all of this is saying is um, it's helping us to remember um, to return to education, to support families and community and our students and our teachers and our administrators. And um, I just really admire this work and hope that it can all be brought in um, to our educational practice so that people feel really, really supported um, and not put into difficult, anything difficult. But it's really great. And I can't wait to see it in action also just in our, in, uh, in our communities, particularly around restrooms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I also applaud the work of the task force, so thank you. Um, I'm just kind of curious about restrooms. Is, will there be any changes made? <coughs> Or so do we far, already I've, currently have in place what we need? We yeah. We currently have in place what we need. There are gender neutral spaces in every school. I know there's been lots of discussion about having more of them, and so that it, it's a work in progress, absolutely. But already there are gender neutral <coughs> bathrooms in, in and school. changing spaces in every, yeah. Yes. So kind of expanding on like the bathroom question, I know mm -hmm. at the high school, especially with sports, like we have showers and a lot of mm -hmm. people use the showers. Are there gender neutral showers? There's, I'm not sure if there's a shower space at this point. Okay. So we still have to look at that, but there is, we've been using the trainer's room as a gender neutral sp changing okay. space. Yep. Cool. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that was a first read for, um, Policy ACB. Thank you. And the second one is stay up there. Yep. Um, <laughs> is a, a first reading again on administering medicines to students. And it's uh, this policy has not been revised since 1996. Is that right? Well, it was. Uh, need of updating. It was updated in 2006, but from what I could find, there wasn't any substantial change between 96 and 2006. So, okay. so this is the first. This is the first major revision of it since the regulations around medications in schools in Massachusetts were first adopted. Great, so it's 96. So it, um, th this includes sections on storage, self-administration, documentation, delegation, special circumstances, and exceptions to the policy. So if you have questions, direct them out. And this, I should explain, <laughs> this is um, the MAS, C did come out with a new revised model policy um, and several districts, I have probably a dozen uh, other districts policies that were revised uh, in the last probably two to three years that I built off of. Um, but our old policy was very, it was too general. Usually we like general, but when it comes to medication, not so much. There were a lot of things that are in regulation that weren't adequately reflected in our policy. And there's been lots of changes um, in additions to the regs since 96 that were not reflected in our policy. So that's what you see here. Discussing yet? Are we in discussion? Mm -hmm. um, it, this is really <coughs> just a, um, a whatever, sort of a small point. Nothing on the actual mm -hmm. policy itself, which reads fine to me as a layperson. Um, but it just seems odd that we're starting with the negative. <laughs> I know, and <laughs> I just noticed not that not be administered. Just it seems like we should flip it around and say, like our other policies, what it is we're really trying to accomplish in a more positive tone. And the original policy did state medications may only be, be administered when. So I don't know how it got. Right. Flipped around, but I agree. So that's just a suggestion. I guess I don't have a specific, maybe Howard, I, 
things so quickly on his feet when he's got like, flipped around the father. Here's a pen, sir. What do you think? <coughs> Medication may only be administered by the school nurse. I don't know, and not by students. But why do they get changed from only to not? Like, it means two different things. I have no, I, I don't really know. I, I don't know. I just modeled the language after well, because it's Another got the unless. It's the unless. 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 It's, it's, right. So you have there to have the so double negative. Right. So it's sense. a double negative. And the reason is because I think they're trying to limit when it can be given. Right. As opposed to saying it can be given by a school nurse, which doesn't ask, which doesn't answer the question, but can it be given any other way? Okay. I'm trying to say it can only be given by a school nurse. Right. Isn't that what we're really trying to say? So that's what they do by putting the knot up there is yeah. to really anyway. highlight the fact that yes. it's limited as opposed to... And I think that probably yeah. comes out of uh, a lot of issues over the last few years around it. So that's the format of the other correct. policies is correct. to start with the negative. Yes. Okay. I do have a question. What's the difference between medication and medicine? None. Okay. And I don't understand that amendment. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to leave the, the negative at the beginning. Is that okay? To just be consistent sure. with, okay. These are still first reading. So yeah, first someone yeah. has an amendment that they'd like to bring forward next month. If they're crafting something over the month, please feel free to do so. All right. Thank you so much for Thank all you. of your work in these two things. Yeah. No problem. You could stay up for the next one if you have any. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks. Right. Um, the next is also a first reading, and it's an, a revised uh, NHS advertising contract, and that is KHBE, um, and that is an addition of outside signs. You could see if you have that, and then the inside advertisement criteria. Those were the major issues. Any questions or? Questions, discussion on those? Did this come up because there was a problem? Well, it came up because of the next item, really, oh. that we're, is that, do you agree, Dr. Provost? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the booster club one multiple levels of sponsorship and we needed a change of policy to have advertising on the inside in the gym so we needed to change our policy so then we needed different levels of payment for outside versus inside can i go back to the medication some more <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. um i just I, I just don't this is not clear to me what this means um it's just the very first sentence um by the school nurse acting under request with instructions for dispensing medication, a physician's order from the student's physician, <laughs> and a written, signed, and dated request from the parent right. guardian. So that's just. It, just seemed, it seemed like there's some extra words, maybe. It's explaining what a physician's order is because not everyone understands what a physician's order is. So it's not only because sometimes what we get is something written on a prescription pad that says give Johnny this yeah. and that's it and that without the written instructions and under, so, under our license we can't give a medication without the specific instructions so that's all it's explaining what a physician's order actually okay. contains so I guess maybe if you could propose it, I, I don't want to do it because I don't want to mess with make sure it's but this the acting under request seems a little bit weird by the school nurse acting with the instructions for dispensing medication from the student's physician and a written sign and data request from the parent or guardian it makes sense to me but the under and request words which are in there i don't i seems it seems like they should be stricken through also to me so i just yeah i, I guess as i listen to the question i just would ask Karen what would we do in a situation where the physician is ordering a child to have a medication but they're not requesting it or the family's not requesting it correct we, so couldn't, <coughs> we couldn't give it so is that why you have both so it's in. that's that's part of it because in order to give a medication you not only have to have parental written parental permission but you also have to have the physician's order under right. the regs so I get the I get the end there maybe but it's uh, under the request the, but I just want to see it's, it's acting with instructions for dispensing it from the student's physician. And it's it's the called, so I get that. but the physician's order is called a request, and the parental uh, permission is called a request in the regs. Okay, I so, don't know why. So when it says acting under request with instructions, what we're saying what we're saying is 
acting under a physician's orders with instructions for dispensing. A physician's order so is request a request is to order. give the medication with the instructions. That's what a physician, that's the definition of it. So that's why those words, which don't seem to make sense to me, are in there, is because request yeah. means the order. Correct. Doctor speak, not lawyer speak. It's exactly. <laughs> it's DPH speak, actually, to be clear. Yep. It's Would the way it's written in the regulations. It's under request as opposed to under a request? Uh, it could be under a request. I don't know. <laughs> Fine. Study it for a month. Huh? I think it that just he's doesn't make sense that there's to me, not, but I want to make sure it's not. There's not an article before, like we would say, yeah. like, the request. Or a request. That's fine. To under order. You can add an article. Under a request. A request. So yes. add an A. I have a school nurse Second. under a request with instructions. Well, I want to make sure that's a not request. No, that's fine. You're saying that that's say. fine. Is that what you're, you're saying? Yeah. You're just missing a article. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that is hard. fine. Would that be okay? Thank if I made that amendment in a month it's or fine. two? Fine. In a month or two. <laughs> okay, so note that, Howard, for <laughs> next month. <laughs> and, and remind Are me we of done it. with Miss Jarvis Vance now. Yes. yes, I am now done with this. I'm sorry. Thank you. Leave again. now. Yeah, leave right before. Before you can't Howard has say. another question. Resolve my question. Can you get to resolving yours? Okay. So we're back in the advertising contract, which came, yes. <laughs> which came out of a request from the Booster Club to have inside and outside signs, and we needed a policy change in order to get. Um, signs inside into the gymnasium. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Same way. It's all we ever do, isn't that Policy is it's important. Mm -hmm. So, questions for KHBE, the advertising contract. Again, this is a first read. No. Where do the outside signs usually go? They're on the uh, softball backstop. Uh, softball backstop. And there's stadium. And there's an allowance for them to be on the perimeter fence outside the track. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I don't think they're, I haven't seen any there before. Okay. Do we have a, ma I can't remember, do we have a maximum number of advertisements we can have? Well, we've never, we've, we've never, never had, had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be nice. For the last three years, there have been four signs on the right. softball backstop, and that's been it. But right. the Booster Club is hoping that this new multi-level sponsorship campaign will get us more sponsors and more advertisers on our athletic events. Because there are other places. Is the, is the, is the, is the um, you know, the cage for the uh, discus, is it, is, it, is it allowed as a location? I, I don't know why anyone would pay two cents to have their <laughs> sign there. It's, it's really hard to see from any spectator spot. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, just out of curiosity, um, I mean, it seems like whenever we talk about this stuff, we're really talking about the high school, but does it ever affect, I mean, when we go back to sort of, I mean, a booster club is a fundraising organization, I mean, it goes back to Ms. Hennessy's question about equity in our schools, and um, I think it's, if you can answer this, but I think sure. it's because it's the athletic booster club and the varsity I think it's it's very specific, it's very specific high, school, high school sports. But theoretically, well, so I mean, go ahead. So this really is part of an ongoing activity that we've had for about three years to try to consolidate as many sports boosters as possible under the NABC. Okay. Um, and at this time, we're only fielding high school teams. Um, there, it is conceivable that some of the NABC activities, because they're not specific to sport, could also support middle school teams if we ever expanded the athletic program to the point where we were fielding teams at that level. Um, based on the size of our high school, I would say that would have to be, if we wanted to start engaging with other districts that had middle school teams, because we, we have too many athletes at the high school to do a, a seven through 12 team or an eight through 12 team. So that's probably the only scenario mm -hmm. in which it, the middle school would be included. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next, that was the first reading, and the next is KHBR, which is advertising the schools. And again, this came out of the NABC. Um, 
where they wanted commercial messages and really the changes were inside versus outside uh, designated wall areas and we did remove there was one um, phrase that allowed for signs on stadium fencing as far as the first tr tree which we removed in case there was no longer a first tree it's funny <laughs> Oh, there wasn't that. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> that was funny. Okay. All right. All right. And then the last, um, which is a discussion, um, which was we were want to have a discussion and a vote regarding the meeting schedule with the Student Advisory Council. And I'd like to, should I make a motion to make that? Um, discussion and vote at our next meeting when we have more than six members here. Second that motion. <coughs> There's been a motion made and seconded to hold the vote uh, the meeting schedule of the Student Advisory Council to the August meeting. Any discussion on that? I will say the reason is it really sets up a schedule for five times during the year and with the student advisory committee so Elena, um, I would just hope like it is the summer so if there are six people again at the August meeting I would hope that we would not postpone it again because we'd like to have a schedule in place for once the school year starts I had just, in the rules and policy subcommittee meeting um, we talked about various options for how to meet the statutory obligation to meet with the student advisory council and I felt strongly that that's, that's a new obligation that this committee is taking on, so it's something that we all ought to talk about how we want to take it on, and that it, it, there, the things that were brought up, one possibility would be that five meetings during the school year, we would come here half an hour early and just meet with the Student Advisory Council. Um, another option would be to, that we talked about possibility of was to maybe have a subcommittee but that, that met, the lawyer met did with the us. lawyer say yeah. you can speak to that yeah. okay um, so I did follow up with the school committee attorney on both the alternate options that were discussed at that subcommittee meeting one of which was to form a subcommittee of the full committee to meet with the advisory committee and the other was to appoint a liaison to um, liaise with the with the student advisory committee uh, our attorney said that Really, if you think about what you're trying to accomplish, it's to follow the plain reading of the law. So if that's what the goal is, you should just do what the law says. Um, of course, if the committee is interested, they'd be willing to do a lot of legal research on whether it's possible to obtain a waiver from the Department of Education. But I think both in just sort of the common sense reading of the statute and what I understand to be the intention of the committee, um, it makes from my perspective, uh, just relaying what the attorney said, makes most sense just to have the full committee meet with the advisory committee. Mm -hmm. And rather than have another meeting per month, it seemed like this was a time when we had a meeting. We're getting into a discussion without the other members right now, but. Mr. Moore? That's okay. We could. Yeah, no. Are we all going to be here in August? So we, nobody has to like put in their thing. We, <laughs> um, but I. The, this, the meeting, does it simply say we'll meet with? Is that what the statute says? That's what I recall. But Five times just, per year. But, it, but we'll meet with. It, it, so it's, it, this is a meeting then of the school committee because every time the school committee yes. gathers, it's a meeting. And um, I guess I'm, that is my only other question. If, if very simply, if... It, <laughs> Is it a separate, if it's a meeting of the school committee, it's a public meeting. It has, you know, it's, I guess I'm wondering, is it, a, what, what would be the difference between simply what we already have, which is a student representative, and what we, and, or, and maybe it would be additional student representatives participating in the school committee meeting. You know, with, with perhaps an agenda, agenda items being just as school committee members can put items on the agenda, the, the student advisory council will putting agenda items on the meeting agenda. As a, as, because essentially, if this is it's it's like the two bodies are meeting, but they're actually having a, it's a school committee meeting at that point. 
And so I just don't know why not just making it into a school committee meeting. So. Well, uh, I think practically it, it would be adding at least a half hour to a meeting that often mm -hmm. goes fairly late. Yeah. Um, so starting it, bumping it on that side of 715 seemed better than th that side of 1215. Right, and so that's, why, hyperbole. so that's why I think maybe it's right to have it be scheduled as you were proposing mm -hmm. with at the same time. But maybe, maybe it's, I don't know if it needs to be styled as like a meeting before the meeting. Because as soon as this, a quorum of the school committee sits down, it's, it's, a meeting. it's the school committee's meeting, whether, whatever we call it. And so why not just call it the school committee's meeting and the first item on the agenda is, um, you know, I guess decided sort of by the school, school count, the, the, the student union. Elena? Um, so I, I do have to like meet with the student union and talk about this and everything, but just in terms of like my goals for bringing this up is that, you know, first of all, I, <laughs> the school committee meetings are long and there are a lot of votes that don't pertain specifically to the high school. Um, I don't know if I could get five other or four other people to come and sit through a school committee meeting, although they are wonderful and I appreciate them. <laughs> um, so realistically like that, we'd have to think about that. I also was hoping that it would be a way for the committee or members of the committee liaison or whatever um, to have a chance to discuss issues like the AP testing policy or like cell phone use at NHS, which is our, on our agenda later, to have more of those longer term discussions um, with the student union at NHS. Um, I was hoping for some a, a different type of meeting that would be more structured around discussions and like those larger questions of institutional change. Um, and of course, we'd have to assess that on like a every two month basis on what we would want to be talking about. Um, but I don't know if it would be able to be structured in that kind of like, oh, let's put a, a vote or a report on the beginning of a school committee meeting every two months. Um, so that's just, that was my goals for it. Um, but I think I, I do have to talk to the student union and obviously like you guys are very important in having feedback because I want this relationship between the student advisory council and you all um, to be the best possible. Um, and I think what, you know, one of the things to remember is that we cannot meet as a body. Like there's only, I mean, only, you would only get, is it, it would be two members, right, that could meet with the student outside of a meeting, right? So it can't be more, I mean, how does that you could work? You have four. You have four. four. But also okay. like a subcommittee, because a subcommittee is but like. No, but a uh, subcommittee then. But that doesn't fulfill the statutory yeah. requirement. That's right. But and then a sub. I'm sorry if I can. Please, no, step in. I mean, I just a wanted to. Of this, a, a subcommittee of the full committee then is also subject to the same open meeting laws and all the other considerations that you're bringing up. Right. But the fact that our school committee meetings are run by Robert's Rules of Order is in our rules. But there is nothing in our rules which says we can't have an item on the agenda that is for discussion, mm -hmm. which doesn't require anything. Um, and so, so within our rules, there's room for the sorts of discussions you're talking about. And we've done them before. We had, for a while, what was it four or five years ago, we had a sort of um, reading group. We had the school committee had an item every time. We were reading, the, we were reading a essential school committee book and discussing it for, it was a number of, of, of meetings in a row. Um, it was a book discussion here at this school committee meeting. So um, I, th I think that there's no reason within our rules for that not to happen in terms of the quality of the discussion. I, I'm just cognizant of the fact that I we motioned and seconded <laughs> to not have a discussion. Right. So I, 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 th I love the discussion, but I do think we put, put it out because we wanted other members to participate. Yeah. Well, we de definitely had on the table uh, to hold the vote in the August meeting for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. but I'm sure we'll have a similar discussion. Yeah, I think so. Well. so. <laughs> that, I, that, is that motion still pending? Yeah, yeah so that's still okay. on the table. So we'll, let's call a question then. Question's been called. So uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, so that'll be postponed the vote until the August meeting. Thank you. Next we have a discussion on student cell phone, cell phone use at NHS. 
Um, so um, I'm bringing this up um, as an inquiry, really, that um, in the high school our students are getting older and they're using cell phones in ways that our younger students don't. Um, and it's an interesting time as we sort of, as technology is just changing and the science of technology and the effects of it on our brain and community and all of these different layers. And it was um, kind of brought to a couple of us on school committee um, that it could be a really interesting study to look at how the community at NHS um, is feeling about the how cell phones are used. Um, and I really was um, interested in, um, you know, I have no opinion about it because I have no relationship to it. And so I put this out more as um, that it seems like something that we need to return to as a, as a learning community to look at how cell phones and technology, you know, this kind of mobile technology is being used and how we can support the high school. Um, and I guess I feel like what, what would be, what I was kind of conceiving is um, a group made up of students and parents and the, of course, the high school principal or vice principals or any teachers, administrators who really are, you know, in the, in it, um, to examine how it's all going and to take another look at it. Um, I hear mixed things and I have no idea. So that was sort of the, the heart of putting this out as a discussion. And superintendent. Sorry. Um, I was just wondering if you were coming up. <laughs> I'm just going by what hand I see first. I have a, I have a quick right hand. Um, I was just wondering if you were coming at this from the perspective of like use during class time or if you were coming at it from the like social media kind of like culture aspect. I guess I feel like um, I just, you know, to be honest, I, I, I think like both. Like, how do we, what, what is our relationship as community members um, with cell phones in our schools and how it's maybe affecting students positively, negatively, learning time? Is, it, does it take a while for teachers to tell kids to get off their phones? Is it a, is it a distraction? Is it a benefit? Um, are there ways that, um, you know, the, you know, if it, that parents need to sort of know more about it because even though high schoolers are independent and fantastic and can take care of themselves, you know, they are still under the charges of an adult, yes. um, <laughs> you know. And I guess that, you know, I, I keep kind of returning to this idea of just exploring these ideas and, and sort of letting the community define, you know, helping, asking the community to define the space. I'm not in the space of the high school, so I have no idea, but I certainly have heard stories where people feel that it's a distraction. And, you know, as a school committee member, um, you know, I want to support the teachers and the students and, you know, and the administrator in, in being sure that um, this tool is being used as well as it can possibly be and that it's clear how it should be used. Um, Dr. Provost. I just wanted to say that I think that we can salvage a lot of the discussion from the last item to this, um, because I, I do think that it would be helpful to be able to explore the issue in a way that wasn't bound by the requirements of open meeting law. And so what I would ask or offer to the school committee is if it wants to direct me to form a study group at the high school to be comprised of representative group including students, teachers, administrators, and parents to have a discussion about the issue and then come back to you with my conclusions at a later date. I'd be happy to do that. Ms. Hennessy, uh, 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 Mr. Lee, then Mr. Uh, <laughs> Moore, and then Mr. Zansky. <laughs> Fortunately, four of our members are not here. <laughs> Great. I would, I would wonder if you would want to add um, Principal Wilson because I, I can imagine that it's still an, it's an issue in middle school because I think it's eking into the elementary schools now. I mean, I know it is, so it's definitely at the middle school. Mr. Reed. My concern is the roles and responsibilities of the school committee, which is big picture, 
goal setting uh, and not uh, regular running of the schools and that we not be stepping <coughs> into a place that's really your domain and the building heads domain and it seems to me that the only place where they um, where our role might be involved in this is in the changing of policy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moore. My su suggestion was that, that you know, this, the, I, I, when I read this agenda item, my actual first thought was, well, you know, we have these school councils, and they are made up, theoretically, of students, teachers, administrators, and parents, and community members, like not part of the school directly. Um, and you know, this I think it was exactly the sort of thing that, that school councils are, should be addressing. Um, and it would be, I don't know what we can do as a school committee, because we can't tell school councils what to do. Um, but, but to really encourage them to, to maybe facilitate a broader discussion, in other words, not just amongst themselves, um, but to invite, pe you know, invite other people in, the, in their communities in to discuss this whole, this, this question as you raise, sort of it's, it's an open question because we're talking about a technology that's only been around now for whatever, 10 years, and it's pretty much in everybody's pocket. And so this question of how is it getting on their wrist. and on their wrist and so on. And, and how is it getting used, you know, and, and is it a positive thing? And um, so, so I don't know how do we can encourage the school councils to do that, but I, I would think that that, I mean, the, the advantage of, of convening sort of a working group is that you can get people who want to do this and who are tasked to do it, and you can do that directly, as opposed to school councils who can decide whether or not to put it on their agendas. Um, but they are sort of an ideal group already. Uh, well, I think as probably no surprise to anyone at this extended table, but I applaud looking into this issue more closely. I do think it's an issue that really deserves our attention, whether it's through a study group or I also have thought that the school council could be an ideal place. I think it'd be important to uh, try and bring some expertise to the table. I think we do have folks in our community who have that kind of expertise and be important to hear from hear that voice. I think there's a lot of research out there today. There's a lot of information on what kind of impact it's having on our students. Um, so I, you know, I would kind of defer to the superintendent as to kind of how to, how best to proceed. Um, my concern is I think it's, the school council has not taken it up as of yet. I'm not sure how we could, you know, sort of help facilitate that. And, and again, maybe a study group also, if we're going to also wrap the middle school in, might just be more, um, a more effective way to get that sort of middle to high school perspective. Yeah, um, I guess I, I um, having been on school councils for so many years, um, they, they take on a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess that um, one of the pieces that I was really thinking about this, and, and our uh, Karen Jarvis Vance is here, that they've done such extraordinary work around um, you know, I feel like this is, I, I mean, I know that I, I just keep saying like this is an exploratory, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of stuff that we can learn about the brain science of technology during our school day. And I feel like it's a, it's a really beautiful collaboration if it was a working group. So we did have a, a screening of screenagers in the spring. You did, mm -hmm. that's right. That was fairly well attended. There was uh, quite a bit of interest among people there um, of continuing that conversation, although trying to figure out with everyone's busy lives how to make that happen was really challenging, and it was spring. So we have already talked to the company who's offering us a great discount to bring it back again in the fall. So we will be bringing it back again and hopefully being able to do more than one screening. We were really hoping to do it at the middle school and the high school, but weren't able to work it out. And we would also like to be able to offer it to students to be able, it was offered in the evening, yeah. but to be able to show it during the school day, I think would be hugely useful. And it covered everything that you're talking about, raised a lot of really great questions, lots of room for discussion. And then if something happens out of that, whether it's organic or orchestrated, um, that would be great too. So I can offer that. That's the end.
<laughs> Thank you. It does seem like this study group would have maybe afford us the opportunity to recommend a policy that I could see coming out of this. Not necessarily, but possibly, whereas if it's at the school council level, um, you know, we wouldn't sort of be in a position. It, would, it could impact the handbook, but maybe there's a policy. I, you know, I know this is seeping down into the elementary school as well. There's a lot of issues that we're sort of contending with as, um, as we talk about this more. Yes, I have one mildly cynical response, which is that a rhetorical question for you that you're far too diplomatic to answer in the public forum, but of all the things you would like to have study groups about and all the problems facing districts, how high on your list of top 20 problems to fix would this be? Um, I, I've heard conversations about this issue in classrooms and I think there are teachers at the high school who react to the issue of phones in their classrooms in completely different ways and I think they there are some who say put it away right now if I see it you're out there are some who use it as a tool they say go look up you know this formula so for I have big misgivings about us imposing on you a study group um, and which might potentially impose more restrictions on teachers who are already dealing with enough. I mean, if you had a choice between this, this is again rhetorical, you don't have to answer this, but cell phones at NHS or overbearing DESE regulations that take up too much time with, with uh, teacher evaluations, you know, which one is going to have the most effect on, on student achievement, which is what our mandate is, is to set goals for the district that will improve student achievement. So I just want to kind of put that out there that, that this may not really be something that we want to impose on you as one more thing to do with your time. Elena? Um, I just, you know, if we choose to form a study group, I would really encourage, number one, that a lot of students are involved. Um, and I think not only that they're involved, but they're also asked, you know, what's the best way to go about studying this? Yeah. I think a lot of times when these conversations come up, in my experience, it's like students are the bad guys. It's like, oh, students are on their phones so much. And I would really, really encourage us to be looking at this from a different perspective. Um, and maybe saying, like, hey, is it, the best way to go about this to be talking to you about the science and talking to you about that or is it more of just a practical when you're in the classroom if a student if a teacher tells you to put away your phone put away your phone um, so I would just hope that a lot of students not just like two or three are included in the study group okay um, so I believe the superintendent <laughs> has made a offer to us to uh, look into this, uh, create a group, and then report findings. Is <coughs> if they're interested in this, if they're interest among this body f to charge a superintendent with that? If there is, would you make a motion, please? I can't make a motion, but I have a question. Um, is there some, like, we're in the summer, is there some sort of, like, time frame? When you create a study group, do you put like a time frame on it or like a goal or how does that work? <laughs> um, well, I would say there'd be an aspirational goal in terms of time. I, I strongly suspect that this may take longer than initially um, I might estimate. I wouldn't try to do it during the summer because I think it's really important to have, as you said, a lot of students involved, but also to have a lot of faculty involvement and administrative involvement. Um, you know, I'll just share one of the things that I have as a anxiety or trepidation as I venture into this is I don't want to get the committee or other school employees caught in the middle of a generation gap between young and older people. Um, that may turn out that that's not a, a valid fear, um, but it, it is one of the things that I worry about and I think may take a lot of time as we start to unravel this. 
I mean, really and honestly, you know, I think that this is, um, I think that that's kind of almost puts the finger on why I think that this conversation is really important. And I put it out as like, it would be really cool to be able to have conversations about this, you know, exactly what you're saying, not putting it on um, the students themselves, um, but, you know, going back to the screening of screenagers and having discussions and sort of how we have discussions. I mean, we have those posters all over school about, you know, parents not having drinking in um, their homes and, you know, healthy lifestyles and things like that. And so, I mean, I'm intrigued for all of us as a society, kind of how do screens, um, you know, how are we all playing into it? But of course, you know, this is a school committee. I mean, I can examine it in my own personal life, but, um, but I also really respect Mr. Reed's um, take on it. And, you know, I just wish, or, you know, or maybe it's that we let this year, we let these things come out and we let the health services um, director find ways to do this or that we encourage conversations in students to, you know, think about it themselves. I don't, you know, I don't know. It's just something that's definitely in our um, society. And I, I feel as school members, it's important to examine ourselves in relationship to what is happening that's being given to us now. I mean, that seems like a really interesting exploration, not a horrible thing. Um, but that's me, that's my approach to life. So, um, and you know, I really wanna reiterate that yes, it's about the students being a part of it. I mean, it's about a school community having conversations. So, I don't know, I mean, I'm just putting it out. We can do nothing for a little while too. And we can return to the conversation when we have more people here. I mean, it seems like a couple approaches have been brought up, right? To maybe see if the school council can examine it, to see if there's, you know, this upcoming screen, screen agers, et cetera. Maybe it's sort of a different Wait, I don't know, Dr. Provost, do you have any opinion on what would be the best way to, or proceed on this? I think I'd want to have a data informed discussion and I'd want to know more about um, the level of concern that both students feel about being exposed to phones and the <laughs> teachers and, and parents have about the exposure to phones. Um, it's really, I have heard anecdotally um, from parents' concerns about their children's access to phones. Um, I have to say that I, I find that <coughs> a little confusing, just putting my cards on the table. Um, I, th I think of it as slightly different than um, sort of substance abuse because there aren't phone pushers out there who are trying to get kids to experiment with phones. I mean, for the most part, it's parents who are putting the phones in the kids' hands. Um, so to me, that says there's a level of consent there. So, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Is there a phone pushing ring, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> um, much like what the research is showing, the brain science, uh, much like gambling, which you could also say is that you can say anything's a choice, right? The neural pathways that are being changed in the brain by constant obsession with screens look a lot like addiction pathways. That's what they're seeing. And I can personally say I am not ashamed. Well, I sort of am, am ashamed. But I will very honestly say that I am really borderline I don't want, addicted to my phone, too. I mean, I sleep with it next to my bed. And I'm a, gr I'm, a, I'm a grown adult, I don't have Snapchat, I don't, have a, I don't do a lot of the social media stuff, but I definitely feel anxious when I don't have my phone. I definitely check it very frequently. A lot of the symptoms that you look at for somebody that has an, an addictive uh, behaviors come into play when, when we're talking about um, phones and, and technology. And it is definitely concerning to uh, developmental pediatricians, to psychologists, um, that this this could be, uh, and that's the premise of screenagers, that it could be affecting our brains in ways that we're not even aware of 
yet, or we may not even know about yet. But so far, what the research looks like is that it, it can be very similar. So just putting that out there, it, it is definitely something t for discussion, whether or not, I, you know, it's not any of my business if it's a study group or whatever it is, but I do feel the evaluations that we got back from screenagers where that were, those were the most in-depth <laughs> evaluations we've gotten in any program that we've done. People were writing paragraph upon paragraph, um, very concerned, wanting more information, wanting to, mostly to talk to other parents. Mm -hmm. But that's a really challenging thing to orchestrate. So I think that in order for this to happen, it, it probably cannot be a district school driven thing. It needs to be a, a parent driven thing. That's just my opinion. We can provide the information and the vehicle, like the screening, but then to keep it going, you're, you're going to need people to be interested enough. So. Dr. Provost. So I, I don't really think I disagree with what you're saying. Um, and I, I guess what I'm saying is if a parent wants to provide a device to the child, and then the school wants to limit the device, mm -hmm. it's setting up a conflict right there. Mm -hmm. So if it's, so if this is something maybe that is better addressed through parents, maybe we can support them through education mm -hmm. and they can make their own decisions. Um, maybe that is a, a more potentially um, fruitful route to travel than for us to try to study it and come back with recommendations that result in a policy that's either keep it the same or change it. Yeah, I don't know about whether and, policy changes are really a part of and, this or really just looking at, much like we're looking at how we're addressing gender in the classrooms. <coughs> so how are we, how are we addressing, so are we talking about the fact that looking at it constantly, checking it, checking it, checking it may not be healthy for, for anybody right. that, you know. Helena? I, I do just like, I, I agree with Dr. Provost and I think that we have to be very careful that we're not making recommendation, recommendations for students' lives mm -hmm. outside of school. Um, you know, it's, it's about what happens in the classroom. And I think if we want to like instruct teachers to limit what's in the classroom or talk to teachers about that, that's great. But that kind of like parent education, making decisions about what students, their actual behavior online and how they engage with their phone, that, that's about students' personal lives. And I want to make sure that the conversation is about how it's impacting the classroom. Um, it, but it does impact the classroom a lot. It does. Because what, what is happening outside of school does come in and impact the school environment. Not all the time, but it, it does enough that it's concerning. I think we should find some way to look at that. And yep. Dr. Post is talking about some data-driven evidence on yes. how it's impacting the classroom and if there needs to be something done about it. And. I just I just want to add that I you know I that the NHS PTO has also heard from parents who are really concerned about how much their children are able to use their phones during classroom times for non-educational purposes. So I know you've heard the other side of it that parents concerned that they're able to reach their child at any <laughs> given second of this school day, which I don't quite understand, but that's okay. So I think there's a whole other side of it, and I think the NHS PTO, having sat in on their meetings, and, um, I, I know that they'd be really interested in, in working on this issue on the other side of it, because I think you're right, parents have given their children this device, and you know they owe, they, there's some responsibility there. It'd be great to hear from them on this subject and, and see what role they can, or they want to, or can play in all of this, because I think they're, they're an important piece of this puzzle. So. There's also a safety issue, though, too, with that con that constant connection. When there's a any sort of safety issue in the school, and every parent is trying to contact their student on their cell phone, it jams the cell phone towers, and our first responders are not able to communicate. Really? So that's why we have in our safety procedures that we're really teachers shouldn't be allowing students to call, and, and it's horrible because you're. I, I'm a parent too. I have four kids, and if something were happening at my child's school and they had a cell phone, you bet I'd be wanting to make sure my child was okay. And it'd be really hard for me to temper that and say, you know what, I need to trust that they're going to be taken care of and not 
try to you know communicate with them in order for the first responders to be able to get through those those channels it, it, it would be very difficult but the more we talk about it and the more we explain it the more that might help people to be able to actually do it mm -hmm. but it, that's a huge concern Again, I brought this up because I have no idea what's happening, but um, it would bum me out if teachers are having to tell students to turn their phone off when class gets, I mean, that seems like a waste of time on learning, you know, but again, I don't know anything, and I feel like, you know, there's a parental piece, and I feel, I mean, it's been an interesting conversation, just this much um, <laughs> brings out a lot <laughs> in people. Um, again, I really respect Mr. Reed, respecting your time and, and wondering if this is um, the, you know, the way to handle it. And I, I, I don't know, but I do feel that this small conversation has brought out a lot, which makes me feel that there's something that we're digging at and maybe we haven't gotten to exactly what it is. Would it be helpful to have Mr. Lombardi come and speak to us in a future meeting in regards to what the policy is and maybe after speaking to his staff, what um, some of the concerns they have are or the benefits and the detriments to having phones in the classroom? I don't know, maybe at some point in a future meeting we'll have a, another discussion. I, and then I, finding I, ways. I mean, again, I think, you know, I really don't, I mean, I really would like to hear from the students as well. I, you know, I really, you know, honestly, this was like, let's look at this stuff and see, you know, where do kids need phones during the course of the day? Where are they helpful? You know, where is it difficult that we can give information? Where do parents need help? I mean, we're a community. <laughs> parents, students, teachers. Dr. Provost. I wonder if Ms. Jarvis Vance is aware of any validated instruments that are used to uh, gauge students' cell phone use. Cell phone use. Actually, it's funny because I, I was working with uh, Boston University on looking. There have been some studies. It is incredibly difficult. What we actually proposed for a new study is not to measure how much a student or a, a young person or any person <coughs> that matter is on their phone but how much they're off their phone because that's easier to quantify than how much someone is on their phone so right now this there are very limited studies about looking at um, hours of screen time and it's not just phones so they're measuring all sorts of screen time um, in relation to sleep in relation to um, I think there's one around academic performance, but there might only be one. There's very limited literature. Um, and kind of responding to Dr. Provost, just on like a person by person basis, you can find out how many hours you're on your phone just by looking at your battery, pers like your battery data in your settings. Mm -hmm. So like an exercise that's really interesting to do as a person is to look at how many hours you were on each app in your phone mm -hmm. in a given 24 hours. Yeah. And that's pretty accurate because it's from the phone itself. Although if you forget to turn them off, it's not always accurate because they're running behind mm -hmm. the scenes even if you're not on it. Tennessee. Sorry, the yeah. I, um, <laughs> I, I work in another district where the school committee has a very strong policy around cell phones and it and it's very it, it is the only thing that the student council talks about I mean when they go to the school committee that is it it is the most significant thing and it is probably the number one thing every meeting teachers have um, and in part it's a policy imposed without teachers really talking about it and it's complicated but it's more than what's happening in school um, so I, I don't, I feel like it has to be more organic, I mean this is organic, but coming from the community and having these other discussions and not, a, this is me, a study group ordained by um, the school committee, I think it needs to come to us if people want a policy or teachers want a policy or students and teachers or, and, because it could become bigger than what I think 
it is such a concern. Just now, we disagree, and we're, and so I want the conversation. I'm concerned about it, and I did have hear that study, by the way. I just participated in a training about if everyone would be on their phone, and first responders, it was terrifying to me as someone who I know every kid would be on their phone. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think it should be coming from us. I do think we should participate as maybe as committee members individually or as, certainly as parents, as community members. But I, th I think it has to be more organic and not from us. It has to come to us, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. My favorite idea is what I think Mr. Moore proposed, which is that seems perfect for the NHS yeah. school council. council. That's the, the community that... <coughs> JFK school council. Or both. Yeah. They can talk to each other. Yeah. And if they don't want to do it, I guess that's a measure of their priority. I'm not clear. I mean, it's an interesting idea that you raise, Ms. Hennessy, but I'm not clear how it would kind of come from the community to us to. Um, I don't. I I'm not sure how I that would work, and I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't either. I will tell you. I, I worry about us creating a policy that we have these discussions on and then we impose it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's too big of a problem for a policy to come and try to deal with it. It's too complicated. And each classroom teacher will have a different view on how they use it in the, their classroom. Mm -hmm. And so a policy of no, no cell phones in the classroom is a, seems to me absurd because the National Council on the Social Studies is telling us to use our have students use their cell phones. And then to say you can only use it in the hallways and the cafeteria seems like it's against all social norms that we want kids to be doing. And yet, um, so crafting a policy just seems like it's uh, impossible. So I don't know where it would come from. I just I right. worry that creating something would be. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that kind of the idea behind the study group that it would actually be some conversation between all these bodies? I mean, I think school council is another, yeah. you know, viable possibility, but I think we're just coming off of this great task force where, you know, we just set this policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this task force says, I mean, it's, you know, very impressive that we were able to, I mean, I think that's an example where we said this is an issue we want to look at. We want to study it, and what came out of it was a policy, but also changes to student handbooks. It's obviously, I, anyway. So yeah. it's just yeah. um, I, there's something organic about that yeah. to me too. Yes, I agree. That. That's true. And, I mean, I will say that it was brought. I mean, this was not. I mean, I have no connection to the high school, so I didn't know about this. But this has been brought to me by several people asking about it who have connections to the high school. Not and just so, parents, but teachers. not just parents. It's probably after screenagers. <laughs> it's a really interesting film so I, I mean I would highly recommend if we have a showing in the fall that yeah. you come and see it and we had um, Kathy Cassell moderate yeah. so people were able to have some discussion and it was a great discussion it could have gone on all night much like this yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well I'm happy to um, to uh, you know, put this idea to the side and let screenagers come forward. I would really like to see, I mean, personally, I think it would be really interesting to see um, more conversations about this, and it can be educating parents uh, so that they can, in all of these regards, but I feel like, uh, you know, it is a new technology, and parents are new to it, and Students, you know, we all need to be scaffolded, and I also really want to support the teachers, also. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. You made thank you. Down. <laughs> 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 yeah, I told you to leave. <laughs> sure, she can talk about one more thing. <laughs> okay, so moving on, um, we have a vote to increase hourly rate. To for student techs to $11 an hour. Ms. Walczak. Yes, if you recall back when we did the budget, we made a decision through that process to increase the rate of pay, mostly for subs we were dealing with up to the minimum wage. Although it doesn't apply to us, we felt it was fair to try and pay our staff that a minimum of the $11 an hour. Shortly after that, as I was processing timesheets, I realized that we had student techs 
uh, working in the theater program and at the time had one IT tech working, both of which, both groups were earning less than $11 an hour. So I'm coming forward tonight with a recommendation which is supported by the IT director and the high school principal that we increase the rates for the theater techs and the IT techs up to $11 an hour, effective August 1st. So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. We have a transfer uh, monies from an inactive NHS club to the Student Financial Assistance Fund and Student Activity Accounts. Ms. Walczak. Yes, at your last meeting, you approved a policy where we created uh, student assistance accounts at both JFK and the high school within their student activity fundraising accounts. JFK at this point does not have any inactive clubs that they would be able to move funds in. They will continue to watch that and look at fundraising opportunities. Um, but the high school does have seven accounts that have been inactive for a number of years. You've got the history on when the last, last transactions were. And the high school principal is requesting that he be able to transfer the funds from each of these accounts into that new student financial assistance account within student activity. So they have some funds to start the year to provide financial assistance. So moved. Is there a second? For the purpose of discussion. Second. Mr. Reed. A question for you, Ms. Walczak. I noticed that one of the inactive clubs was the drama club. And meanwhile, I know that the NHS theater group is working really hard to raise money for a musical. So I, I just was confused. The, is it possible that this, that the something called a drama club no longer exists, but NHS theater does exist and that the, this money could be transferred to them? It, there are two different groups. This is a club that used to exist separately from the theater group that no longer does exist. Um, it's possible it be transferred there, but the principal has requested it be transferred here. I guess if you say no, that could be something he could consider. And I, you know, I share Mr. Reed's concern about the drama club funds. I know what Dire Straits the, um, I, I know, I don't know about Dire Straits, but I know that the NHS musical is um, under threat of uh, not occurring and how hard they've been working to raise money. And so I would really like to first look at the possibility of moving that money to the musical or to the theater department or whatever the appropriate channel is personally. Um, and then secondly, I just was kind of interested, uh, wanted to question this guidance <coughs> transcript script fees. I mean, it sounds like a really fun club, but <laughs> <laughs> I just don't quite understand who would have gone. It actually, obviously it was not a club. Um, the high school used to charge um, graduates a small fee to get a transcript. Uh -huh that we actually are not able to do that. If we continue to do that, those funds have to revert to the city's general fund. We can only keep money when there's a law authorizing us to keep it. Obviously, selling kids or graduates their transcripts is not a fundraiser. Um, so in discussion uh, about two years ago when I got here with the high school, we determined that rather than charging for transcripts, they would be done for free because they didn't really see a point in charging five or ten dollars for a transcript and then turn that over to the city's general fund. Gotcha. So there's been this balance sitting there. I did check with the city and they have no particular interest in having us return these funds to the general fund so they are okay with us diverting them into the student assistance fund. Great, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I totally understand that the theater department is struggling to put on a musical and would totally benefit from those funds. My only concern with that is, you know, if we're, if we're associating these funds with these clubs with the departments that that topic is generally in, then like photography club could go to the tech department and graphic novel could go to the English department and Devil's Den could go to athletic boosters, so. They, they have to go to clubs. This is a yeah, student so activity account, so they would. I was pointing out what um, Ms. Musansky and Mr. Reed yeah. were talking about with the drama club monies going instead to the theater department. Yeah. Um, just that if we did that, it would seem weird not to then move like the other. I don't think there's an English club, and I'm not sure that these, that there are clubs for all of these things, but. Um, yes, so my point was more that 
Ms. Bizanski and Mr. Reed were talking about taking that drama club money and instead asking Mr. Lombardi to use that to support the theater department. That was my only point. But isn't there a club for the theater department again? Friends of the theater department? There there's a student activity account for theater separate from this one and then I think there's a theater booster club that has formed in the past year or so. Yeah. So, so there's technically like there's a student music. activities club, for, there's student activities fund for things like the it, programs in the tech department, there's student right. activities account for those other things. So I was just wondering if we're making like that move, why we wouldn't then look at the other ones. Recommendation too. of the principal. Um, we can either send these all back, you could approve them all except the drama club, you could approve them all. I mean, this is the request from the principal to get some money into that fund. If you want to send it back for further review, we can do that also. Mr. Reed. I'm wondering if the superintendent has uh, suggestions mm -hmm. in terms of what Mr. Lombardi might be able to do to, with this, you know, once we, if we voted for him to have this money, would this be something that he might decide to use to, to benefit other clubs? As I, I think everyone on the committee is aware this really is an outgrowth of the discussion we were having around international travel. And Mr. Lombardi, I think, was very clear at that meeting that he shares the goal of trying to make as much travel as accessible to as many students as possible. This was, um, in part, a response to that. Um, so I think that if these funds transfers were approved, his prime priority for those would be to try to make more students able to access our international field trips. Any further discussion? Yes. What we're saying here, though, because this is the first time I've heard of this, is that this drama club doesn't exist, right. but there are students who are participating in an after-school activity, theater, who are in desperate need for money. And if they weren't participating in this, they possibly would be in a drama club, but it doesn't exist anymore. And now we don't have enough money for the theater. Yes? Is that the kind of issue? Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the part about they would be participating in the drama I mean, club. I can't really speak. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just the, but I think Ms. Fragmini raises a really good point. And there's definitely other funds from other clubs that could be transferred in a similar. It's not like any of our departments are so flush that they couldn't re wouldn't really or any of the clubs really so it's a you know it's definitely a hard call it's just a, more familiar with maybe the real struggle of that the musical is having right now yeah. so it seems like the drama club is a very easy kind of yeah. transfer way to transfer that but yeah. but it's not straightforward I yeah think. no I hear that Sheree just my own reaction to this is that I think we have to let the principal make his own decisions yeah. that this is not our purview. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so with that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, thank you. So now it looks like we are on to the business administrator's report, and that would be Ms. Walzak. Yes, you don't have a financial report this month because we're still in process of closing the books, so hopefully you'll have a year-end report for your next meeting. Um, E-rate funding, there was mention earlier tonight of the first award that we were notified of about a week ago, which was the $20,423 in the E-rate funding for the internet, internet access, which we basically reallocated most of that tonight. We also received notification yesterday of a second E-rate award. Um, they do it by category, so internet access falls into category one. The letter that we received yesterday was for category two, which in our case, don't ask me to define these, but includes funding for internal connections and maintenance of internal connections. And I hear terms like switches and all that around, so it's probably some of that technical stuff. Um, the letter that we received yesterday gives us an additional $28,856 in E-rate funding. At this point, the IT department has not made any decisions yet on how they will reallocate their budget in lieu of what will be covered with E-Ray. And then the last item tonight are the gifts from the PTOs and the community. Continuing our gift theme. 
from the PTO. There's actually three gifts here that I don't believe I presented in the past. If I do, I apologize for not recording the date. But there were three PTO gifts to JFK Middle School related to the Global STEM program. Um, they came in to support three different teachers working together on Global STEM products projects over the end of the school year. Then were $500, $500, and $400. Then Ryan Road received three donations from the PTO. One was a Chromebook cart with a value of $870. Another was $108 to, to fund the summer Saltis celebration they had at the school. And then a donation of, I'm having trouble reading my numbers at this time, eight, looks like $900. Um, for rental of equipment for their field day at the end of the school year. And then the high school had one donation from the PTO of $485 towards uh, approximately 50% of the cost of a water filling station. And then there were six gifts accepted by the superintendent that came in from groups other than PTOs. Um, there was one from Thomas Hanley a donation of $700 to support at the high school the library's diversity collection. There was a donation with an approximate value of $600 from James Clayton for a tent canopy donated to the athletic program. There were two donations of gift cards to Bridge Street School from Tim and Wendy Van Amps. I should say one gift card there. Um, and also one from the UMass Language App acquisition lab to Bridge Street School for $75. And then Bridge also received the donation from the American Benefits Group of nine Dell computer monitors. And the last donation actually was PTOs, but it was all of the school PTOs put together. All of them donated a total of $525 towards the Special Olympics that was held in June. Now the personnel report. Yes, this is June's report, so it is mostly separations. We had 28 um, individuals, which included eight long-term subs, leave the district in June. Uh, it was 12 teachers, five ESPs, three cafeteria um, recess monitors. We had nine retirements that we actually celebrated at the last school committee meeting during the appreciation time. And then we had one transfer within the district of a secretary from the high school into an administrative assistant position at the school to replace somebody who retired. Thank you. Uh, we now have a vote to authorize the superintendent to carry over vacation days to the FY18. All I can say is I tried harder this year, but I still wasn't able to take my vacation um, days I did do better, um, but I still have a balance in excess of 10. I'd like to um, carry over 10 days as is allowed in my contract. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Take more next year. <laughs> we'll try. Do maybe, better. Maybe the right. superintendent evaluation committee can make that. I think goal. I should have said that. <laughs> Absolutely. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No abstentions. Okay. And lastly, we have the superintendent's report. Dr. Provost. Thank you. Like many in our community, I've spent much time in recent weeks trying to understand the recent events at JFK Middle School. I've spent many hours discussing the sexual harassment walkout and demonstration with school committee members, school staff, and one of the demonstrators. Um, I really hope to get in touch with more of the demonstrators and certainly have put the word out that the door is open, but to date, um, unfortunately, I've only been able to have discussions with one of them. What I can tell you is that I've found expressions of frustration and hurt on all sides. In my conversations with staff, my fundamental question has been, what will be the most healing response? Our expert witness, um, Karen Jarvis Vance was present for one of those meetings, so she, she can um, testify that that really has been um, the focus of what I've been asking of all the people that I've been talking the matter about. Um, and right now, I feel very strongly drawn to JFK as the place within the district where the healing work is most needed and should be attempted. I also find that data-informed responses are helpful especially when you're dealing with emotional topics. 
because emotions can easily lead us down dead ends or incorrect paths. So let's talk about some facts. In all the media accounts of the demonstrations, there were only two instances where students say they reported harassing conduct to the administration. And this closely matches the data that we just submitted to the Department of Education. Every year we do something called the School Safety and Discipline Report. Every school is required to submit it to the Department of Education. And the SSDR report um, tracks student discipline for offenses related to drugs, violent or criminal related offenses, and some non-violent or non-criminal offenses, including sexual harassment. In our report this year for JFK, we recorded 490 incidents of behavior significant enough to be reported to the state. Only one of those was identified as an incident of sexual harassment. So we have near agreement from media reports in our own data um, of either one incident reported or two incident reported. So the question is, how much harassment has gone unreported? Well, I can tell you on our 2015 JFK Student Social Norms Survey, 11% of students admitted to referring to girls at JFK using insulting names. Likewise, our Prevention Needs Assessment Data Survey from the same year showed that 89% of students said they feel safe at school. So I think it's important for our students and the community to understand that overwhelming majorities of students don't think it's okay to make harassing comments to female students and also overwhelming majority of students feel safe at JFK. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge the 11%. The 11% of students who do feel it's okay to make harassing statements to female students and the 11% who say they don't feel safe at school. And above all, I think we have to remember the one thing that unites all the 11 percenters, whether they're the 11 percent who admit to making the comments or the 11 percent who report not feeling safe at school, they're all middle school students. They're all sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and they're growing up in an environment <coughs> that's replete with confusing and sometimes hurtful messages about how they should relate to each other. So I've said from the beginning, we should have an educational response primarily. At this point in my thinking, I think we're going to have a response with at least three prongs. The first of which will be curricular. I've asked our director of health, safety, and equity programs to work with our uh, curriculum director and PE and health department to review and revise the middle school health curriculum. The current curriculum includes the All Stars program, which is an evidence-based program to prevent, reduce, or eliminate negative behaviors. And the eighth grade curriculum includes a unit on safe dates. Um, the topics related to All Stars curriculum and obviously the, eight, the safe dates unit are taught in the seventh and eighth grade. So in addition to reviewing the efficacy of those two programs and the way they're being implemented at the middle school, I've also asked them to take a special look at sixth grade um, as a potential area where sexual harassment prevention can work because currently that isn't part of the curriculum. And maybe one of the um, lessons of recent weeks is that the curriculum should be um, made more robust in that area. Um, although I'm not going to lean too heavily on curriculum as being the um, likely solution to this because in my comments with the one or my conversations with the one student I've been able to speak to, um, she was very frank about, look at, there is a hierarchy of subjects at the middle school and health is at the bottom. You know, It's a place where we're not expecting important curriculum to be delivered. All the pressure is on ELA and math and science and social studies. So um, I'm not certain that making the, the curriculum stronger will be enough of a response especially if it's in a, a topic where students are thinking of it as a, a way to sort of escape some of the academic pressures of other subjects. Um, so the second prong will have to do with reporting the, improving the reporting procedure 
um, including educating students on how to make a report. If we have 11% of our students admitting that they're referring to girls by insulting names, but only one or two reports have come forward, it seems likely that a lot of behavior is going on and not being reported. Um, so in this, I think we kind of have a model in the work that was done several years ago across the state with bullying. A lot of um, the responses to bullying had to do with changing procedures, educating kids about reporting, and I think that has definitely had an impact. Um, so I think that will be, and that actually, I have to say, in my conversation with the one student I was able to speak to, was her main desire for an emphasis for response. Um, because she said that it was difficult for her to understand how to report and that um, there were some forces she felt sort of holding her back from reporting. So we could make the administrative procedure stronger. I think that would be a good second stage. And then the third prong will involve some kind of evidence-based skill development training to give students effective strategies for resisting and confronting harassing peer behavior. And this is something I've asked the middle school administration to work on. Um, there are already identified some programs that they want to learn more about. Again, I think some of this is similar to the bullying um, work that was done across the state several years ago. Um, a lot of this is about bystander training. A lot of this is about giving kids the language to use when they observe a harassing behavior take place so that they can shut it off. Um, so there may be other prongs as, as I continue to think about this, but that's where I am right now. I think I just want to close by saying that as the students themselves have said, this issue is much larger than JFK Middle School. It's a national and even a global problem. So I have to be realistic about the limitations of my three-prong plan. Uh, it won't change the world, but I want to focus on healing the little part of the world where we can realistically hope to make a difference. And for me, that means getting the 11% as close to zero as possible. And that's my report. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Okay, we have new, no new business. Uh, we have future business and meeting dates. Uh, school committee meeting August 10th, 2017, here at 715 at the JFA Community Room. And at this time, I will ask for a request for an executive session. Thank you. Um, yes, I will request that we go into an executive session in the principal's conference room here at JFK under the Massachusetts General Law 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with NASE and Chapter 30A, Section 21A2 to discuss strategy in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, <coughs> the Central Office Administration and principals, where as an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position in both cases. Do you have a second? I'll second. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's been a, a motion made and second. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Uh, please say yes. No. no. Yes. 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 Okay, so we will be moving into executive session. I must uh, make the public, uh, make it known to the public that we will um, be going into executive session, uh, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position, and that we will be adjourning from executive session and not back into open session.